What is going on guys? Welcome back. In this video today, we're going to try to understand why we need activation functions in neural networks. I'm going to explain the math behind it and I'm going to show you a code example that illustrates how important activation functions are. So let us get right into it. All right, so the goal of this video is to understand why we need activation functions in neural networks and why it's oftentimes enough to have a very simple activation function like the ReLU function uh, to make a huge difference when it comes to what a neural network is capable of. So I wanna give you here, first of all, the mathematical explanation, and then I wanna show you a code example that shows that what I'm saying here is actually true and makes a huge difference. So this video is not going to be very complicated. You don't need to understand a lot about neural networks. You don't need to understand what backpropagation is. You don't need to understand what gradient descent is. The only thing that you need to understand here is how a simple forward pass works in a sequential feed forward neural network. So how we get from inputs to outputs given the weights and biases. That's the only thing that you need to understand. And for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, I'm going to give you a one or two minute crash course here now on neural networks, very, very superficial, high level and basic. Uh, the basic idea is you have some inputs, whatever they are, x1, x2, x3, you have some neurons, and then these neurons are connected to other neurons in different layers. These are called the hidden layers in here. Uh, they can have a different number of neurons, whatever, and in the end we have some output. And the output neurons can be a single neuron, it can be two neurons, three neurons, it doesn't matter. And if these are all now just simple, fully connected, dense layers, so to say, uh, we have all the inputs attached to all the neurons of the first layer. We have the output of these neurons attached to all the neurons of the next layer and so on. And all these connections, this is now important, are weighted connections. So they have weights. Every single connection here that you see has a weight to it. And this weight is a trainable parameter, which means that you don't need to understand how it happens, but there is this back propagation and optimization process where these weights are adjusted so that the neural network learns how to do a certain task. And every single neuron also has a so-called bias to it. So uh, a constant that is added um, or subtracted from the uh, from the weighted sum. So maybe to explain this in a more simple way, I'm gonna use a very, very basic example here, which is going to be just uh, X is going to be an input, a single input, and then we have two neurons here, and then we have one output neuron, and that's our neural network. So I feed X into this neuron and into this neuron, then we have the output of this neuron and this neuron fed into the output neuron, and then we get our output, let's call it Y. Uh, that is a very simple neural network. And now what we have is we have weights for every connection here. So we would have a weight one here, we would have a weight two here. And now this is not a professional notation. Usually you use some superscript for the layer, but I don't want to confuse now anyone who hears about this for the first time, but you have basically uh, different weights here. Let's call them for the sake of simplicity now, weight one, weight two, weight three, and weight four. And what we can do now is, or what happens now is, and of course we also have here the biases. So we have bias one, bias two, bias three. Um, in a simple forward, uh, forward pass, what happens is the input X is now combined with all these weights and biases to produce Y. It's a very simple calculation. So yes, it's machine learning. Yes, it's neural networks. But at the end of the day, it's just a simple multiplication and addition calculation. So what happens here is X is multiplied by weight one, X is multiplied also by weight two. The result of that is fed into these two neurons. Then a bias is added. Then we have the result of this whole thing multiplied with weight four or with weight three, if we go the upper uh, route, then the results here are added together. A bias is then uh, added again, and then we get our input, uh, our output Y. So what basically happens is to calculate Y, I have to say the following, I am taking the bias three, let me use the colors here. I'm taking the bias three plus something. What is this something? This something is weight three multiplied with, and I basically just have here weight one times X plus some bias. So plus bias one, that is what happens in the upper um, in the upper branch here, I take X times weight one plus bias one and the whole thing times uh, W3 and then plus the bias. And also I do the same thing on the uh, lower end here. I do weight four 
times, and then I have in this case weight two times x plus and then bias two. That is how we calculate the output y here. Now, this is already enough to understand if you look at this closely, why an activation function is extremely necessary here. Because what happens here, if you look closely is I have two neurons, and I could also have three neurons. Now, this would just add a, uh, an additional, um, yeah, an additional term here. And I can have also multiple layers, and it will get more complicated and more nested. But at the end of the day, what happens here is I have a linear combination. So what happens here is I can consider this to be if I if I expand this, I have now I'm not going to use the colors, I have b three plus weight three times weight one times x, this is just when I multiply this part here, plus weight three uh, times b one, plus weight four times weight two times x, plus weight four times bias two. That is what I'm calculating here. And if you look at this, you can spot we have two kinds of terms here. We have the terms that don't contain x. And we have the terms that do contain x for this, I'm going to use now green. And what I can do here now is I can extract x. So I can factor out x, I can say that I want to have this weight three, weight one from here. And I want to have this weight four, weight two times x. That is basically the green part. And in addition to that, I have a bias three, a weight three times bias one, plus a weight four times bias two. Um, so basically, I have, I have this part here, the green part, and I have the red part from before. And if you think about this now, what we can do is we can consider this to be just a number, you know, weight three times weight one plus weight four times weight two. This is just a number. So let's say I call this now weight five. And I say weight five times x, I can do that, I can just rename this. And then I can say, all this here is also just a number, right? It's b three plus w three times b one plus w four times b two. At the end of the day, it's just another bias. So I can call it b four. And what happens now is from this complicated or a little bit more complicated calculation here, I end up with a very simple linear combination, I have uh, basically just a weight and a bias. So the equivalent of the network up here would be a simple network that I can train by just having a single neuron, and having a weight five here and a bias four here, and then that's the output. So my network up here, no matter how complicated I make it, I can add five more neurons and three more layers. At the end of the day, it's not more effective than just having a simple single neuron. This is because a linear combination of linear combinations of linear combinations is a linear combination, I have an input, I have a weight and I have uh, a bias. And of course, I can have more inputs, and then it would be a more uh, highly dimensional linear combination. But at the end of the day, this is no matter how complicated I make this no matter how many neurons I add and how many layers I add, at the end of the day, I have a linear model, I can only solve linear problems. So for example, if I have, let's say I have a coordinate system, and I'm trying to fit some data, some very simple uh, regression task, and I have the points, something like this, which, which would be, let's say some x squared function, no matter how many neurons, and no matter how many um, layers I add, at the end of the day, I will always just get a linear model, I will never be able able to model a curve or a quadratic function or anything like that, I will always have a linear model. So what we need to do in order to prevent this is we need to break linearity, we need to somehow introduce something into this calculation here, which breaks the linearity of the linear combination. And for this any function um, works that breaks linearity. Now there are some more constraints, of course, but theoretically, every function that breaks linearity works. And we have functions like the sigmoid activation function, which I'm not gonna uh, write down now as a formula, but it's basically something okay, this is very, very ugly. Let me shift this. Uh, it's basically a function that returns a value between zero and uh, one. And it's kind of yeah, somewhat like this. Um, and we have also the 10 h function, which is the same function just between negative one and one. Uh, but we also have some very simple function like uh, the ReLU function and the ReLU function is 
basically just give me zero for any value that is not um, zero or above and then give me just the identity function afterwards. So the ReLU function is um, rectified linear unit is the name, uh, is a function that basically gives you the maximum of either zero or the input value. So if, if that is x here. Um, yeah, it's a very simple function, but you can see it's not a linear function because it breaks linearity here. It's not a linear function. It's not just continuing down here. It has a break in linearity and it's very efficient. It's very easy to work with, uh, mathematically speaking or co computationally speaking. Um, but it's enough to break linearity. And if I have, because what we do with an activation function, uh, let me just remove all of this here. Uh, what we do with an activation function is basically, instead of just saying we apply the weights, we add a ReLU call, so to say, on the intermediate result. So I multiply x with weight one, and um, then basically I call the ReLU function onto the intermediate result. So in this case, instead of just saying w3 times w1 times x plus b1, I would sneak in, let me maybe make this a little bit smaller here so I have more room. I would say w3 times and then ReLU called on this term. And then I would do the same thing here. I would say w4 times ReLU. So w4 times ReLU on this result. And then of course the whole thing here would also again usually, I mean it depends on the output layer. Oftentimes we don't have an activation function. Oftentimes we have a different one. Uh, but theoretically, if you have multiple layers, the whole thing here would be also again, ReLU this and so on. And then you cannot just go ahead and extract um, or expand and then uh, factor out X. It doesn't work like that because it breaks linearity. And then the whole model is no longer a linear model, uh, but it can model also some more complex tasks. So what I want to show you now is how much of a difference this actually makes, even if we use more neurons and more layers. And for this, I have this PyTorch example here. What we do is we generate some X data between negative 10 and 10. And then we say that the Y data, so the uh, data that we want to predict and model is just the input data to the power of three. So we have a cubic function that we want to model with a neural network. And for this, we have two classes. We have the net no activation class and the net with ReLU class. And they are exactly the same. The only difference is here we use an activation function. So here we get an input, one value, we have 50 neurons, 50 neurons, 50 neurons, 50 neurons, and then one output neuron. And the exact same thing is happening here, but we call the ReLU activation function. So the simple rectified linear unit activation function that I just showed you to break linearity here, and the rest is exactly the same. And now if I take this, I generate the data, I define the two models, I train both models, and I also plot the results. What we get here is we get the following result. The blue thing here is the cubic function that we're trying to model, that we are uh, trying to make predictions for with the, uh, with the neural network. And you can see here that the neural network without activation function, uh, without activation functions, just ends up being a linear model. It's just a line. It's just a linear regression. Now, this is probably the most optimal line, but it's still just a line. It's a linear model, and it will never be able, no matter, no matter how many neurons and layers I add, it will not be able to come close to this cubic function here. Whereas if I just look at the results with the ReLU activation functions, you can see that this is basically almost the same. So it modeled it almost perfectly. We have the model and um, the actual x cubed function here, which are almost the same. And this is how much of a difference it makes to use even very simple activation functions like ReLU. So that's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it and hope you learned something. If so, let me know by hitting a like button and leaving a comment in the comment section down below. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and hit the notification bell to not miss a single future video for free. Other than that, thank you much for watching. See you in the next video and bye.